Thanks, Susan. Um, I'll just start by saying, having a look at the origins of the slogan Black Power, where it came from and what it represented. And I think the way to understand it best is to look at the civil rights movement, which had been going at quite a large scale since 1955, when Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat at the front of the bus and sparked a year-long bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama. But by 1963, the civil rights movement uh, was entering into a period of crisis. The crisis was partly because in the South, the battles were becoming more and more ferocious the more the civil rights movement was winning victories. The South was doing what it called massive resistance. Massive resistance meant that in Birmingham, Alabama, the major city of the South, when Martin Luther King decided that there would be a mass campaign in Birmingham that put children right at the centre of the campaign, the police were prepared to unleash dogs and truncheons and tear gas and water cannon on children as they knelt to pray. You know, that was massive resistance. And Washington would say nothing about it. You know, the Kennedy administration in Washington had not a word to say. And King also found that when he wanted to take the civil rights movement out of the South to start changing questions of racism in the ghettos of the North, where there was no legal segregation, the white liberals that had backed his campaigns in the South were not prepared to give him any backing when he wanted to come to the North, as I, when they turned up on his, their doorstep, they wished he'd go away, and they were quite happy to, to see him on someone else's doorstep. So there starts to create a profound disillusionment, both with the strategy of integration, which had typified the civil rights movement of black and white people, fighting alongside each other for radical change in the South. Uh, there's become dis disillusionment with that, prime, the, the, the integration side of it, primarily because the white allies in the ruling class had effectively abandoned the struggle by 1963 and seemed to want it to go no further. They seem to regard it now as more dangerous than, uh, than, than positive. And also the non-violence which had typified the movement was also now being called into question. If you think non-violence had dominated the movement primarily because it fitted the interests of the overwhelmingly middle class leadership of the campaign. They didn't want massive social confrontation but it also seemed to fit the situation of many black people in the south who found themselves as a poor, unarmed minority, they didn't feel that they would have much chance in a physical confrontation with far superior racist forces of the state and racist gangs and so on. So the, this ideology of non-violence had, uh, had, had went alongside the ideology of integration to typify the movement, but faced with such overwhelming violence from the South, that, those, uh, that idea gets called into question by people who say, don't we have a right to defend ourselves when we're under attack? Do we not have, when the Birmingham, when Birmingham church in Birmingham is bombed by white racists and four young children are killed in the basement of the church, people arm themselves to protect their community against the Ku Klux Klan who are coming to the community in an attempt to kill still more people and people said that's the right thing to do. And so you can see that there ends up being an ideological crisis for the civil rights movement around the two pillars that it had been, that it had been built on up, and, up until that time. And black power, as a slogan, emerges from younger, more radical leaders in the civil rights movement as an attempt to try... Uh, and, and have a uniting slogan that typifies their response. And their response is, no longer should we be dependent upon white people to set the agenda for our movement. White, by white people, they by and large meant white people in Washington and white people in positions of power, but quite often were vague about what they meant and could mean 
white students who'd also come from the north to come and help in the south. They wanted a degree of independence from them too. But in general, it was the idea that white people won't set the agenda for this movement. And also, their black power slogan typified people who wanted some form of, uh, of self-defence when they were acting uh, uh, in the anti-racist movement and were subject to such, such attacks. Something else was changing at that time. So there was this change in the civil rights movement that gives right, rise to the slogan. The slogan originally emerges from one of the key activists, Stokely Carmichael, after he's arrested for the um, millionth time. He comes out of jail and goes directly to a platform and says, you know, what we're going to talk about now is black power. And, it, you know, it's an ephemeral slogan, but it captures the mood uh, at that time. But it wasn't the only place where the slogan starts to fit. Um, because what we start to see from after 1964 is the battle over racism in the US moves from being centred in the Deep South to being centred in the ghettos of the northern states where segregation was not supposed to exist. And here's, uh, here's why, because between 1964 and the end of the decade, every black American ghetto exploded in a form of right and in, in, in an insurrection every summer to the cost of hundreds of thousands of dollars and many thousands of lives. And it's interesting, I'll give you an example, all of them start something like this, but in Harlem started, in July 1964, like this, like this. Uh, a group of teenagers on their way to school in Harlem get into an argument with a white building superintendent who then calls an off-duty policeman who comes with his gun and shoots one of the 15-year-old kids. Uh, two days later, the Congress for Racial Equality, which are the people who organised the freedom rights in the South, organise a meeting to discuss segregation in the South in the area where the shooting had taken place, an impromptu march to the police station then occurs and, and the police clash with the crowd, which is a few thousand strong, uh, and they shoot dead another protester. And after that, all hell breaks loose. The description is, goes like this. Rioters rage through the streets, scattering as police counter-attacked, regrouping to charge again. Rocks, bricks, garbage can lids rain down on the cops. Molotov cocktails burst to flame along main business streets, looters smashed windows. The violence wasn't the, you know, the actions of a small minority or you know, a group of extremists or whatever else that they would normally like to depict this thing. It was a general outrage of the whole uh, 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 of that area. And I'll give you a picture of it. Here's a a quote from a woman who was a bystander gave to, to get, sorry, a woman who gave to a bystander on the night of the riot. She said she was a domestic worker, a single mother of five, and she said this, I clean the white man's dirt all the time. I work for four families and some I like and some I don't like. That night I worked for some I liked, but when I got home the trouble began. I felt like something was crawling in me, <coughs> but the whole damn world was no good. And the little kids and the big ones, all of us was, was crying and thinking that we were going to get killed. And I didn't know what to do. I see the cops are all white and I was crying. I said, dear God, I am crying. And I took this pot bottle and it was empty and I threw it down on the cops. And I was laughing and I was crying. And kind of what it expresses is the absolute pent up rage of people whose lives have been utterly decimated, they were forced to live in ghettos without clean water, without health care, whose children are regularly suffering from completely preventable diseases, whose life chances are being destroyed on a daily basis, lashing out, you know, and that's really what the riots were, an expression of rage, pent up rage, bitterness and anger, and it exploded again and again. So that was America's best known ghetto, Harlem, exploding in 1964. By 1967, New Jersey and Detroit went up, and this time it's not really fair to classify it as a riot. When New Jersey and Detroit went up, the only way to classify it is an urban insurrection. The sheer scale of numbers involved, um, hundreds of thousands of people in the street, many, many dozens of people killed, hundreds of people injured, 
and the scenes are like scenes from Vietnam because in order to recapture the city, and that's what they called it, recapture, they had to send in thousands of troops, all armed with M16 rifles, they had to send in Huey helicopters, and people who were just back from Vietnam were now in the cities trying to recapture the city from uh, the insurrection. So by 1967, the slogan Black Power, which had been raised two years previously by Stokely Carmichael, as part of the civil rights movement, was now primarily a slogan of the ghettos of North America, and you know, uh, 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 and that's quite an important. But the slogan of Black Power is a slogan which had a contradiction at its core. And what I mean by that is that it meant a number of different things to different people. If you were a young person involved in the riots and later insurrections in the northern ghettos. Black power meant fighting back against the police and the racist state. Black power meant let's take power from them, let's have power ourselves. And it fitted very much with the ideas of the Black Panther Party that were formed in 1966. And, you know, fitted very much with the idea of popular resistance, a resistance of the poor, the downtrodden, and so on. Black Power meant something very different to James Brown. James Brown, by the late 1960s, is probably the biggest name in entertainment in America, full stop. And he's a black man who'd risen from being very poor to being a multimillionaire. He wrote a song, uh, you know, you probably you know, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud, but he wrote another song, which is called, I don't want no one to give me nothing, open up the door, I'll get it myself. What he means by that is, for him, black power is the right of black businessmen to establish themselves as the leaders of a community, to establish a form of black capitalism in which they are in charge and which everyone else knows their place. Black power is black power for James Brown, black power for the black bourgeoisie. And so you compare James Brown's vision of Jack Black Power to a young person on the streets vision of Black Power, there isn't a great deal of similarity. And you can see the contradiction illustrated even more sharply when you look at the speech that Richard Nixon made in 1968. He's the Republican president of the US. And he says, what most of the militants are asking is not separation, but to be included in, not as supplicants, but as owners, as entrepreneurs, to have a share of the wealth and a piece of the action. Uh, federal government programs, Nixon said, should be orientated towards more black ownership. From this can flow the rest. Black pride, black jobs, black opportunity. Yes, black power. So if Nixon can declare himself in favour of black power, so can the kid who's doing everything to fight him and his policies. Very contradictory slogan. Uh, and, and that's quite an important thing to grasp. <coughs> By the uh, end of the 1960s and the early 1970s, the black radical movement in the US goes into, <coughs> goes into a very steep decline uh, 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 in a very short period of time. Um, the recession that really starts to take hold at a bit about 1970 hits the black population far harder than anyone else and the destitution that then follows I think is probably best expressed in the music of the time. If you want to understand what it was doing, listen to the records of Curtis Mayfield or Stevie Wonder or Donny Hathaway and the pictures they paint about life being destroyed, about life being hard prior to the recession but now literally the very few things that you were clinging on to being taken away, and you know that gives you a very good idea. The failure of black revolutionaries at that time to find a way of bringing together the anger of the streets, together with the anger in the workplaces and the anger uh, 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 in, in, in the communities, into an effective strategy that could unite them all meant that really that the revolutionaries were some of the people who suffered most in that period because they'd seen their movement rocket up 
you know, the Black Panthers go from a handful of members in 1966 to thousands of members in 1968, selling 100,000 copies of their paper by 1968, and then suddenly within two or three years of that, the movement is effectively, uh, effectively wiped out. The state's reaction to the Panthers, who had sought to patrol the pigs, you know, with, with armed patrols to stop them racially harassing young people and so on, the state's reaction was so great that most of the leading Panthers were either in jail on things like murder charges, which was going to see them in jail for the rest of their lives, or they were seriously wounded, they'd been involved in gunfights and, and had ended up being shot, or they were dead, in the case of you know, little Bobby Hutton, Fred Hampton, gosh, you know, how many more, uh, the, the list goes on, or they were in exile, you know, uh, fleeing to Algeria and other places in order to try and escape retribution. So the, the, in the, the leadership of the movement is, is, is kind of beheaded. And inside the party itself, it's riddled with police informers and agent provocateurs and really becomes an internecine battle between the different elements within the organisation. And politically, as a result of this, a major disagreement emerges, which I think is quite important because it does, again, refer us back to the question of black power, between those people who wanted to continue to engage in patrolling the pigs and being engaging in what were revolutionary type actions, albeit somewhat adventuristic, so, and those people who wanted to concentrate far more on what they'd called the serving the community programs, which were the free breakfast for schools, the free plumbing, the healthcare clinics, and so on. And this really becomes an argument inside the organisation between reform or revolution. And it, you know, it tears the, the party apart. The community side wins, but at, uh, at the cost, really, of the, of the organisation. The, the Panthers split many, many times, and most people just fade away. So that's what's happening to the revolutionaries who had, who had promoted the slogan uh, black, 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 black Power. The, it coincides with a, a massive increase in the number of black elected officials, um, which in, in turn reflects an increase in the size of the black middle class. One of the things that the Nixon administration grasped in that phrase, that, that quote I gave you from Nixon was the best insulation for them from these black rebellions which threatened the stability of the whole of their system was to create a buffer class of people who would act to absorb the shocks, to act as a, a means of letting steam out of the system, of giving people the sense that they were represented, that their cries were being heard <coughs> without challenging the system. And so you start to see that. In 1964, there were just 100 black elected officials in America, just 100, uh, for a population of you know, just some under 2 million at that time. Um, by 1990, that had grown to 7,000, and today it's just over 9,000. So, you know, it's absolutely huge increase in the number of, uh, of, of black elected officials. And the attitude of the elected official to the more radical revolutionary elements is quite interesting because it's quite contradictory as well. They kind of support the struggle so long as it advances their own particular interests and wants to rein it in the minute it, it has the potential to create so much instability that it disrupts their business and political, political life. So here's a quote to, from one businessman. It says, when you ask about the black militant, militant, I have to say I appreciate the changes he helped bring about in the last 10 years. Unless there were people running around in the streets <coughs> throwing bricks, I wouldn't be where I am. It wasn't, the, it wasn't until the riots that we got legislation in the Johnson administration. It took H. Rat Brown and Stokely Carmichael to make white businessmen look and talk around, talk to Whitney Young. If they weren't burning down the cities and having riots, the business environment wouldn't have asked, who can we talk to? I, that black layer, the middle class, the businessmen and the elected officials, 
knew that the only reason that they had come into being was because the lower orders were in rebellion. But at the same time, they understood the continued struggle of the lower orders threatened their position. Because unless they could be seen to be acting as a buffer and containing the struggle, then the people who are the real ruling class of America would regard them as having failed to do the job that they were supposed to do, to be that buffer class. So that, I think, is quite, quite important. And, of course, the creation of such a big middle class and elected officials acts as a means of drawing away people from the radical movement into ever bigger campaigns to get more black people elected. You know, you've got a problem, you haven't got a job, your housing sub substandard, your kids haven't got schools, don't take to the streets, don't demonstrate, join the campaign to get such and such elected and they'll do it for you. And so it tries to pass the initiative from below into the hands of a class. I think what you see with the Obama, and this is where I want to conclude, is the logical conclusion of that element of the strategy. That is to say, Obama reflected the aspirations of literally millions of black and white Americans for a society, both a society without racism and a society in which the gap between rich and poor started to close. You know, and that's the feeling for all the people who celebrated Obama's initial election victory on the streets. You know, it was to, they thought there was going to be fundamental change. They expected Obama to, do, to act, act differently. And except that what we've seen of Obama in office is that his main interest seems to have been to uphold the interests of capital. And I think in some ways it's quite interesting to see what the Republican commentators think about this. There's a guy called Bruce Bartlett who's a, you know, served in the White House as an economist under George Bush. And he says, the nation no longer has a party of the left, but one of the centre-right that's akin to what the Liberal Republicans were in the past. There's no such longer such a thing as a Liberal, Liberal Republican Party. So he's saying essentially that Obama occupies the position economically that the Liberal Republicans used to occupy in, in, in the past. And he quotes Obama himself about the recent tax changes which have massively benefited the, the, the rich in the, you know, the, you may have remembered the changes that happened after the so-called fiscal cliff at the beginning of this year. He says, Obama told a Spanish TV language station, the truth of the matter is that my policies are so mainstream that if I had set the same policies back, uh, I had back in the 1980s, I would be considered a moderate Republican. You know, so the whole idea was that this class of people, the black elected official would absorb the anger of the poor. And in a way, Obama's initial victory seemed to be showing us that he was going to do just that. But in many ways now, he's moved so far away from the dreams and the aspirations of people who put him there, how effectively can he do the job of channeling that anger? And I want to leave you with that question and a poem that Langston Hughes wrote in uh, 1951 called Harlem and he, he says this, he says um, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Does it fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? And I think the last line for me is it, because the situation we have now is that I think Obama's ability to play the role of buffering between the naked, raw anger of millions of Americans whose lives are being destroyed by the recession, his ability to do that is massively compromised. I don't think he's capable of doing it any longer. And that means that when the next explosion comes, I think it won't be something that can be channeled through the black middle classes and through the elected officials, I think it will be something far more fundamental than that. And on the surface, everything seems calm in America. There seems to be no major challenges to the order. But that's what it always looks like on the eve of a storm.
Yeah. Yeah, I do have two questions along with the contribution that everyone put. Um, the first, like, around the question of the riots in the late 60s, um, I've had a few arguments with people whether they are or they aren't race riots. My, my perception is they're not race riots. Um, they're clearly riots of the most, the oppress, the most oppressed black people in the United States. Uh, taking challenges and fighting back against symbols of white authority, um, symbols of, 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 of capitalism and the local bourgeoisie and stuff like that. And there were semblances of racial unity within those riots, which differs the sort of race riots you would have seen in the early 30s or so, where it's actually white racist supremacists going around rioting, usually aligned to the KKK, killing loads of black people. Uh, um, so I, I want your opinion on that, basically. Um, and my second question is, um, what's, what do you think, how do you think revolutionary should relate to the question of, of our election? I just came from Alex's meeting, um, talking about, obviously, the elections in Egypt and stuff, there's a big debate about that. Um, I think we're right to allow to defend the revolutionary socialists supporting the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood in the elections, but I'm wondering what you think of the question is, that question is around Obama. Well, I think the issue around Obama is entirely different than the issue of the Muslim Brotherhood. It's quite obvious, isn't it? It's a revolutionary situation, isn't it? And I think, I mean, I'm a Yank, so I, I grew up kind of in that, in, in, like, within that kind of realm of, of politics. And I think that the thing that you've got to always remember with, in American politics is that there is no, we have no history of the Labour Party. So the biggest differences between, I think, you know, the, the fight in Britain and the fight in America. And as far as Obama, Obama goes, I mean, the, the, what, was, what was brilliant about 2008 when Obama was first elected was absolutely the, the importance of, of, of the first black president. And in the, you know, in the talk before this, we acknowledged that you know, black people are oppressed regardless of class. However, <laughs> working class black people experience that oppression in a much more pronounced way. And as soon as you have a, a black person like Obama taking that leading position, then they are actually going to be, he's going to be contributing to the oppression of, of working class and the exploitation of working class black Americans. And I don't have the stats on me, but it's, um, it's proven that as far as the um, conditions for working class black people in America have significantly mm. plummeted mm. since Obama got in, you know. And as far as, you know, the progressive reforms that he promised the um, NHS reform, for example, it's, I mean, it, it, it is a minutia in comparison to what we actually have here. It basically just opens up the door so that anyone <coughs> can actually have access to buying and purchasing health insurance. But that doesn't mean that you, don't, you aren't still paying. At times, you know, my uncle has to pay something like, if he was able to afford it for all his kids, it would be nine grand a year for his whole family, healthcare. So it's very, very far from, from an NHS. Um, so yeah, so it's like, Um, I just, I wondered if uh, this was something you think American people recognize, Obama being a sort of buffer figure, whether you think most Americans kind of, yeah, recognize that. Yeah, um, just, I don't know, John has talked about uh, what, what, how does it work with Obama. If you look, I think, a break, some of the break with some of the black working class in communities was visible in occupied Oakland. It was very different from Occupy Wall Street. It was very much more organised. Mm -hmm. um, I know that the Black Panther Party or whatever the remnants of it still existed were operating around that. And you can see from the way that they were agitating around worker struggle as well. There they was, a, a, I think, sharp shift there. So, what what would a Black Revolutionary do, or what the, the, what's the movement going to do in America? Is probably the, you can see the signs that they're looking to go into the organised working class and try and, and develop the struggle away from elections and. Maybe that's where the next stage of what's going to happen in America, but it's very hard to understand. And I know that the race riot one comes up a bit. I wasn't it's just people as they oppressed fighting against the system. It's the same as you know what they say about you know riots in Hogan in Northern Ireland. Is they say you know it's sectarian or something like that. There, and sometimes it's a manifestation of people rebelling against the capitalist system. You know what was in that night the Battle of the Bogside? It was some of the most deprived people rebelling, people call it a Republican riot or a, on a 
well, it wasn't, but it's, it was a whole community saying we've had enough. So you know, it's the same as this. I think you know it can conveniently fall along those lines so they can you know castigate it and, and put it into the thing. But really, what it was is the oppressed were saying we've had enough, and that that, that school should always start off from that point and try not. It's very hard to break because they try and set the narrative, but we have to say no, actually, it's different. Um, if anyone wants to come back to um, like points that other people have made, sort of thing, then feel free. Um, I don't. I don't think it's sort of a comeback, but more than just sort of adding on. I think just sort of talking about how sort of capitalism does use race as a tool in order to. I mean, at times when they're making cuts, saying, "Oh, let's instigate racism again," and it divides the people that need to actually fight against capitalism, but also they use it as a way to mask what they're doing. Mm-hmm. It's sort of a case of, oh look, no, that isn't just people standing up against capitalism. It is a racist issue. It's a race issue, and therefore that's what needs to be dealt with. Or they sort of, u- I mean, just essentially, sort of the way they use it in terms of to justify what they're doing. And I don't know if people really recognise that sometimes. I think we, it's all been we sort of sitting here and saying that no, this is what it really arises from. But I don't think people sort of, I mean, especially with the media and the way it is at the moment, um, I don't think people get to actually realise that that's what the roots are, that it might not actually be a race issue, it is socialism versus capitalism, but the way that it's portrayed is something very different. Um, just wanted to know sort of if people sometimes recognise that and how to sort of deal with that. Um, we've still got um, quite a bit of time before um, you can come back, but if you want to come back to these and then some more. Yeah, OK. Um, Jonas raises the question of were the 1960s riots race riots? I think it's probably quite important to look back at American history and see what a real race riot was before you make a decision about that. Race riots were a term used primarily to describe situations where mobs of whites would attack blacks, um, blaming them for lack of jobs is usually the trigger and that's where the term fundamentally arises from and I think the attempt to label the 1960s rights as race rights was really about saying there's an equivalence between those racist riots of the 1919 and in Chicago in the 1940s and so on and these new rights i.e. they're just as bad and of course the causes are completely different, could not be more different. The race riots were working class, overwhelmingly jobless people who had been conned into thinking that blacks who were also jobless were somehow or another the cause of the unemployment. Black people rebelling in the 1960s were rebelling at the people, the state, who were the cause of their own misery, i.e. it was the powerless raging at the powerful, where, uh, uh, which is not the same as what happened in, in the race right. So I think for us it's quite important to make that distinction. Now, were there dynamics within some of those uprisings and insurrections of the 1960s that we would, we would, would make us feel uncomfortable? Well, I'm afraid there were. You know, there were instances where people would lash out at people because of their colour of their skin, i.e. because they were lighter skinned or white skinned, or, uh, and accuse them of being the source of their misery. But is that something that typifies the whole of the riot? No, they're actually quite isolated incidences. I don't know if any of you have seen Spike Lee's film, Do the Right Thing, isn't it? There's a short sequence in that in which Korean shopkeepers plead with people who are rioting not to smash up their shop by saying black, you black, we black. That's actually based on a genuine real story from an urban insurrection in the 1960s in which, you know, Asian shopkeepers sought to defend themselves by saying we're black. And it was a successful tactic. It was about saying there's common cause between people who also suffer oppression. Uh, that it's something that we've seen in Britain quite a lot uh, over the years, particularly in the fight against the National Front, where people decided to make common cause with each other by using the term black 
in a way which sought to unify all people who suffered racism because of the colour of their skin. And so I think there's, you know, it, it's very important to us, I think, that, to understand that there's people who wanted to present the 1960s riots as just a riot of black people against white people. I don't really think that that's a, uh, a, a not a sustainable uh, argument, I don't, I, I don't think anyone has looked at it. The, um, the other... Uh, the, the, the other factor is, is to take into account there is the level of segregation was one of the things that people were protesting against. You know, one of the motivations for people in the ghettos to rise up was against the idea that all black people were herded into one particular area of the city and then given the worst housing and essentially unable to move into areas which were mixed. And so the desire of people who are writing quite often was not to segregate themselves and to insulate themselves from the rest of society. The desire was overwhelmingly to say, we want to live in a society which is in which we are not parceled off and given the worst housing. We want to be able to live in better areas. We want our kids to be able to go to decent schools. We want to have access to the same things that you have. So far from being a kind of separatist agenda, actually the, it, it, it's far more complicated than that. The... Um, other big questions. Revolutionaries and Obama, I think it's quite complicated to be honest. The reason I think that is I don't think you can simply look at Obama's record in office and say look how bad he is he's as bad as most Republicans therefore you know, our attitude to him should be simply a condemnation. The reason I, I think that, that that's, it's more problematic than that is that for it's still the case that a lot of Americans, a lot of working class Americans, black and white, think that when they're voting for Obama, they're backing something more progressive than right-wing republicanism. And I think our job isn't to sort of slap them around the face and say, hey, wake up, man, you know, don't you understand what's going on here? Our, our way of addressing them should be to identify with the kind of society that they want to live in. Our starting point should be saying, I agree with you. I want to live in, an anti in a society without racism. You know, you want there to be universal health care. I want there to be universal health care. And our starting point should be to see what we have in common with those people before teasing out some of the problems that there are and some of the things that we would say are, 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 you know, are the things that like the universal health care that he's given us falls way too short of what could be achieved in this society. And I think it's quite important to, to start the dialogue on that basis with people rather than to sort of, we're the revolutionaries and we understand the world, you guys, you know, what are you? Um, having said that, if you're talking to and arguing with people in the trade union movement in the States who are absolutely hardline, we'll vote for the Democrats, come whatever, you know, they are essentially trying to divert people's anger and their, you know, their, 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 their consciousness away from wanting to fight for a better world into a channel of an election. And that's been, let's face it, over the last period of the first term of Obama, that's been the reaction of most trade union officials to strikes, has been to say, let's calm this stuff down, we've got Obama in, let's divert our struggle and put it on the agenda of the president. And, you know, and the Democrats in the Senate, they'll help sort, sort this out. We can demobilise now. With those people, I think we have to take a much, much harder line. And we have to say, the result of following this strategy so far has led to a collapse in working class living standards across the board. Every time we decide to postpone or delay or abandon our struggle in the hope that the Democrats will take it up, what happens is that they refuse to take it up, having initially made the right noises, and we pay the price. So, our attitude to Obama, I think, kind of depends on who we're talking to and what they're saying. You know, uh, I think it's quite a complicated picture, but one where, uh, where our fundamental position is that there's got to be an alternative to this two-party state, uh, which both parties are right-wing capitalist parties. You know, there, there has to be something new has to emerge here, and how it emerges, I think, is almost certainly something that emerges from struggle rather than from some starting from the electoral arena and something that emerges from the ground from um, do Americans recognize Obama as a buffer 
Well, I think, you know, that again kind of depends where you are in the political spectrum and how experienced you are. I think I think that we'd gone so far down the route in black radical politics of thinking that liberation would come through black elected officials that it's very difficult for those people who've travelled so far down that route now to say, oops, something's gone wrong, you know. So I don't think they really grasp it. Do people on the ground grasp it? I'm beginning to think... Well, I don't know if you know about you. I saw a Channel 4 thing that Matt Fry was doing on the um, Channel 4 News the other day. Uh, he was interviewing people who are community activists where Obama was a community activist, dealing now with foreclosures. One guy stands up, and he's a very poor guy, and he just says, this, Obama's done nothing for us. You know, Look at what's happening to the community. We're being decimated. Another guy is another poor guy who's also a community activist, who just says, yeah, but imagine if the Republicans in were in. Things would be much worse, you know. And I think that, that rather than people having the, you know, wall pull, you know, a bit coming away from their eyes and them seeing the real deal, there's a, there's a debate going on, a massive debate about how to interpret this at the moment. So I, and I think, you know, it's a debate we, were, we work on and we would like to be, you know, to, to, to be involved in, I think. Um, and I think that that was quite interesting for me because I think it tells you something about where the next level of struggle may emerge from in the, in the US. I think the foreclosures issue, which is people's houses being sold by banks and so on, and we had mortgages, combined with the healthcare issue, combined with the joblessness issue, could lead to all manner of social explosions. But as I sort of ended with, I think it's very, very difficult to predict precisely how that might happen. But what you have seen, in the first term, you know, think about Wisconsin, you know, the huge strike that there was by public sector workers there. Everyone in the world media was taken aback when, you know, thousands of people stormed the state Senate building and sit in it for weeks, you know, and essentially run it uh, uh, whilst there's a general strike going on in, in the city. Um, they were surprised by it, but I don't think we should be surprised by it. I think we should expect these kind of manifestations to to continue and to, 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 to erupt periodically and hopefully with more frequency than they do now. And uh, lastly, on the question of the use of race as a diversion, I just think that that is probably the most, one of the most important tools that the ruling class in Britain has to use race as a diversion. You know, when uh, Gordon Brown used the phrase British jobs for British workers, uh, what was it but a clear attempt to say we are going to favour one group of workers over another group of workers in the hope that they will just fight each other for the crumbs off the table rather than to look at what's really causing, who's stealing the whole pie, you know um, I think it takes a great deal of courage sometimes to stand up against those divisions and one for me, one of the most important things about having a part in an organisation is that Sometimes when it takes a great deal of courage to argue, the fact that you have an organisation that can help you with how to argue, can arm you with some material, and then can say, right, we're going to those picket lines and we're going to go and argue with those people. Because you've got a group, you go and do it. And that is what our comrades did during that, that whole thing with the Lindsay Oil Refinery and the construction workers. We got up very early in the morning, went to picket lines all over the country, and we argued like mad with people who had accepted that idea, even though the BMP were on the picket line and there were, you know, all kinds of right-wing forces trying to, to fan the flames of this. And that's what I think, you know, to me, that's one of the huge values of having an organisation is that to do that on my own, faced with that, I would just watch that on the television and cry, really. You know, you just think, what a tragedy that this is happening. And when you're in the party, what happens is you go to your meeting and they say, right, we're sending a delegation to go to this place. We're going to get up at three in the morning and we're going to go in. We've got leaflets and we've got a paper that tells people why this is wrong. And then people go and do it, you know. And one of the results was that we managed to take, I think we managed to, we helped play the role in diffusing that, that thing. I, not permanently, I think it will come back. Uh, but certainly the first round of it. So, yeah, I, so it's a very important issue. Um, I wanted to ask um, actually sort of so kind of with regards to that and also with regards to the whole like um, using race as a diversion and we were talking about this in the last meeting that I was in as well this kind of this 
the, the division constantly of um, all right, so you've got the division of like the middle class black person and the, the working class black person and of the black person and the Asian person mm. and and I think I my question is probably not very easily answerable but how do, how how can we work around or how can we challenge people using things like race as a diversion and and using these making these splits how can we challenge that hmm. does anyone else want to um, I think Bobby you've heard quite a lot from me does anyone else want to broaden out a little bit on the history of the U.S. and the struggle against the crisis in the 1930s, because I think it has a little bit of an embryo of lessons to be learned for today. Um, if you look at the history of the crash in 1929, 1930, and the resistance after it, um, and actually the, the, there was massive, large-scale resistance in the state. <coughs> um, there were near insurrectionary moments, actually, um, specifically in a general strike near um, in, in San Francisco in 1934, also uh, a near uh, general strike in, in Minnesota, in Minneapolis in 1934 as well, as well as in Toledo, Ohio. And it's interesting that there were there were marches and demonstrations led by actually the Communist Party and um, involving a lot of unemployed and um, and and. and poor black people in the run-up to those big strikes, but actually it took about four years into the crisis to get that level of, of, of struggle. And I'm not saying that, you know, it's you know it's only been four or five years of the crisis, so that's why we haven't had the kind of general strike we need in America. But I do think that that does give us a little bit of, an, of, of, a, of, a, of a, a way of seeing that the response to crisis and the response to, um, and, and the way in which working class struggle will manifest itself will be in direct relation to the objective circumstances. And I think that in America, the fact that we've seen the Occupy movement is really quite inspiring because it shows that, you know, you look at America, probably one of the most neoliberal countries in the world. Um, you know, capitalism dominates, marketization, and the trade union movement is relatively, relatively weak, although we have seen some victories recently. For example, the Chicago teachers had a, had a victory um, last, last autumn. But um, yeah, I just think, the, the whole, the whole, both the election of Obama and also the Occupy movement did kind of show in a way that people do want to challenge some of those dominant ideas. The way in which they manifest themselves might be very contradictory. And the importance really is having the argument of the centrality of the working class. One other interesting thing about Obama is that, yes, I, I agree with what Yuri said, and I know that a lot of ordinary Americans, my mom is one of them, she thinks Obama's a socialist, that's why she votes for Obama, you know what I mean? My mom would consider herself a socialist, you know, so I have a bit of an argument with her about that. But it does show that that's part of the reason why, and especially the right in America, the Tea Parties, mm -hmm. they're incredibly racist, reactionary, they, they, they attack, um, attack Obama for being a, a, a socialist, a Nazi, and, and they like to attack him for being a terrorist mm -hmm. as well, you know what I mean? And, and a lot of uh, Islamophobia going on. So we have to be so quite nuanced with the way in which we approach that argument. But one very interesting thing about the Occupy movement was that in Zuccotti Square, where the Occupy originated, they did not, they refused to align themselves with the Democratic Party and they refused to align themselves with Obama. And Obama did try to kind of come in and claim it a bit, but there was a real, there was a real gap there, which I thought was quite exciting. And it showed that actually there is there a sort of milieu there that's being built up of a left alternative. <coughs> and the trade unionists were, were involved in that. There was protests of firefighters that blocked the Brooklyn Bridge. There was an attempt by Occupy Oakland to help to inspire a general strike. I don't know necessarily how successful it was, but they did have a big demonstration that went down and blocked one of the biggest ports in the state. Mm. So, sorry, I rattled on there a little bit, yeah. but I think that's kind of a way of family. Yeah, sorry. Um, I really like the question around um, the way in which the ruling class uses uses the question of oppression to divide us. I think it's a key question, and I think really a sort of prelude to the question of the civil rights movement of black power uh, and the way we fight against that really lies in the thirties, in a similar sort of period to the period uh, Emma's talking about. Um, the Communist Party. Um, Organized, I mean, for all its problems, organized fantastically around questions of anti racism and questions of black and white unity. Look at Heart in Harlem specifically, Yuri talked fantastically about the sort of the, the consistent revolts in Harlem. And if you read Malcolm X's autobiography, 
he talks fantastically about walking through Harlem yeah. in the thirties and the late thirties and the forties and seeing uh, these communists talking about anti-racism and black white unity, um, selling their paper, trying to relate to a whole uh, ton of, of black workers and the black oppressed in, in Harlem. And he organised the, the, the most fantastic campaigns around unemployment, uh, huge demonstrations uh, uh, encouraging black white unity against police brutality, against the racism of the employers. And it, it is one of the, I think, one of the most inspiring examples of anti-racism, not just in America but also on an international scale. I think. Um, I mean, one example is um, when the Mussolini, I think it was, invaded Ethiopia. Um, the, in a lot of sort of black nationalist groups that wanted to organise organizing separatist lines said, "We're not going to, uh, we're going to oppose Italian businesses and Italian workers and stuff like that." And what the Communist Party did is they brought Italian fascists to meetings. Uh, and, sorry, Italian anti-fascists to meetings and to picket lines. Uh, to address and to oppose the Italian invasion of Ethiopia and create a serious uh, example of black and white unity that I think is a shame what, what, what was really captured and strangled by, by, by Stalinism um, in the later years because I mean you imagine the sort of influence that would have had in something like the civil rights movement the influence, it did have an influence, they could be wrong I mean but the sort of the stronger influence it would have had in the civil rights movement uh, and that power rebellion um, if, if that carried on, it would have been fantastic and phenomenal. Has yeah, anyone got any more questions? I do like the section about how uh, terms are used, and you know, the black power term means one from other mm. to the other. That's, you, you see that so prevalent within uh, different terms that come out of different struggles. Mm. It's always the same from misappropriation. It's also a bad thing about how they, 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 they recognise, you know, um, I always remember uh, the ones we have from Homer, Chuck how you know, that gets used by neoliberal mm. Republicans, mm. and will turn around and talk about fighting against the struggle when our day will come. Mm. And that was actually a cry for 400, 500 years about oppression, mm. is that misappropriation, and how they take something that is so resonant with the public in a guttural way and use it and divert it and it's it's common thread and obviously the black power one is that you know it means so much to different to different people but it's how nixon cleverly worded it and how then it's taken by a completely mm. old you know, buffer class and it's always that same you know, when the struggle rises they create this buffer class mm. and you're seeing it in so many different struggles that they develop around the world so it's one mm. of the more dangerous aspects you know when we have these liberation struggles what comes out of it how do we fight against it is the, mm. is the hard thing is how do we retain it without it being used and diverted is one of the, the, the key questions or the key kind of answers that we, we need to find. Okay, um, if there are no more questions then um, we can come back to them and go about. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you, Subi, what, uh, uh, about your question. Were you asking about people who seek to use race as a mobilising factor, like people who try to create a black movement, or are you, were you asking about people who have attempted to use race as a divisionary Yeah, tactic? but as a divisionary tactic. Right, oh, okay, right, fine. Um, well, what do we do about that? I think the, the key thing that we emphasise as socialists is what class interests we have that unite us. Having said that, where oppressed people fight back against a racist system, regardless of what class they are, the job of socialists is to support them and not to put preconditions on it and not to say we only support the black working class when they fight, we don't support the black middle class when they're fighting racism or, you know, we only support the workers. No, no, no. Uh, the socialist position has been for more than a hundred years, uh, coming from Lenin and the Bolsheviks, it was to, to support, to understand that oppression can create cross-class alliances in which you know, the job of a socialist is to fight alongside all those who are resisting oppression, but not accepting the idea that everyone who suffers from oppression is one homogenous block. You know, like it's the case that in Britain today, black and Asian people 
are enormously divided by class so that you have black and Asian MPs in the Conservative Party who represent the interests of big business just as well as white Tory MPs and represent the interests of big business. What do they have in common with black and Asian food processing workers that were on strike in Birmingham you know, at, at, at the end of last year? They have nothing in common. And so the oppression tends to push people together on the basis of who suffers. And what happens in the movements against that is that quite often the middle class people end up taking the leadership of those struggles and determining and limiting the movements to, the, to reflect their own needs. Our argument is to always side with the oppressed against the oppressor, but within it to argue that working class people often have their own interests, which are particular to them, and which we mustn't allow to be squeezed out by these very often very articulate, very well educated uh, leadership figures who themselves represent you know, their own class interests. So that, that's one side of it. On the other side, what do we do about the effect that that division can have on class unity? I think we have to be absolutely ferocious with people who uh, who accept the art, who believe in some way that they have superior. You know, for people who've accepted the idea, chauvinistic idea that white people are, you know, more intelligent, more you know, better in every way. I think we show them absolutely no bloody mercy, and we uh, we, we we can use ridicule and humour to do it sometimes where that's appropriate, where, it, where it's appropriate to, to mount demonstrations and sometimes blockades to stop them getting access to people, we, sometimes that's appropriate, but our, we're, our starting point is always we have to do whatever we can to isolate and expose that view as being, as being false. And that, I think, is something we increasingly do over the question of the EDL, I suspect now with UKIP that that's something we're going to have to do a lot more. And I think, you know, I think it's not going to be easy to deal with UKIP in the manner of a demonstration, is it? Because UKIP aren't marching. But UKIP's ideas, which are essentially saying countries full up, full of foreigners, the foreigners are taking over, you know, the foreigners are after your job, we've got to find good ways of intervening it wherever that argument raises its head to knock it down and sometimes it is to take the piss out of it you know but which is you know which is kind of why saying you're stupid but sometimes you actually have to take on the actual you know the argument the nub of their argument is it the case that white people in britain are unemployed because people are come have come here from eastern europe well you know, there's the Labour answer, which is yes, probably is true, and there's our answer, which is no, it's not. There would be unemployment in this country even if, in the last 10 years, not a single immigrant had come to Britain. Why? Because the system is dependent upon profit, and they have decided to close whole industries down because they're not making enough money from, from it. So it's, it's profits that have determined the levels of unemployment in this country, not the level <coughs> of immigration. And I think having... A familiarity with those kind of arguments is going to be one of the real reasons for being a revolutionary in the in the coming period. I think everyone has to really familiarise yourself with the quick response to a racist argument. You know, so that's that's one thing. <clears throat> um, Jonas spoke very well about the 1930s, and I don't think I need to say any more about that. Except read the books. The read the books are brilliant. Um, if you want to know some of the books you can read about that, you can ask me, or maybe Jonas will tell you some of them as well. Um, and there's articles in Socialist Work about that as well, that some of the ones I've written, other people have written over time, if you want to know about that more. How do we struggle against the um, claims of people that uh, uh, to be... Well, how do we struggle against the buffer class? <coughs> well, I think I kind of said that in trying to explain the... Um, the class basis of, of, of oppression. So I, I don't think I, I want to dwell on that too, too much longer, except to say that it's very important to, to, to listen to the people who are making the argument because people do it for lots of different reasons. You know, there's people who start off by saying, you know, we need more black representation. It would be stupid, uh, criminal, for us to line up and say, 
what's the point of more black representation in Parliament? These people will never lead us anyway. You know, we don't want any more black MPs or women MPs or anything of the kind. You know, that that would be a madness. Um, our position is we want the as far as possible our democracy to reflect the, the working class of this country. However, we don't, if we any people who think that that method will bring about a change in circumstances, then they should don't they look at America. And they should look at America for, like I said, 1963, 64, the number of black elected officials is less than 100. Today it's over 9,000. The condition for black people in America has not improved. For most black Americans, life has gotten worse. So the idea that your quality of life is linked to how many black or Asian MPs that there are in Britain today, it's not. Um, uh, it's important in the sense that it gives people more confidence to fight and to demand their rights when they see more black and Asian people in Parliament because they think, you know, things ought to have changed by now. And then that's kind of what happens with the Obama question, isn't it? People think now a lot of people who invested their hopes in Obama think things ought to have been better, and that's a good aspiration to have. That's something we, we think is positive. So that's why I think that's it. Thank you.